Welcome to my channel, The Binge Eating Therapist. I'm Sarah, former binge eater turned psychotherapist, and my mission is to use this space to bring content to you to help you understand your struggle with food and break free from binge eating. And today's video is a Q&A. A couple of the questions are lockdown related, but I think that the experiences uh, and the questions are relevant uh, almost any other time. At the time of recording this video, we're into the second week of a four week lockdown in England. Um, uh, but I think that a lot of this would be relevant even when the restrictions are lifted. So the first question is, I'm struggling in lockdown and I'm not currently working. I'm finding myself constantly in the kitchen eating. I'm not fully binging, but I can't seem to stop grazing all the time. Can you offer any advice? Now, I often talk about binge eating um, and how binge eating tends to be eating a lot of food in a shorter period of time. But actually, that grazing throughout the day can feel just as compulsive and can be just as much of a problem for somebody. Now, I don't know from the question whether for this person, not working is a, is a positive thing for them or whether it's not a positive thing for them. So firstly, like I'm wondering if anything emotional is going on about this. Is the eating to do with dealing with the anxiety of not working? Is there some uncertainty around their job? So first of all, there may be some, or there may be an opportunity to look into what's going on emotionally and to just check in and name. So often we're constantly distracting ourselves and we don't really know what's going on for us emotionally. We just know that we want to be distracted and we want to be doing. So sometimes taking that moment to pause and check in, like, what am I feeling? Are these feelings affecting my choices when it comes to eating and feeling like I need to distract with food? So that would be one thing to consider. But also, like, when we get out of our routines and we're sort of doing that eating sort of gradual or constantly throughout the day, it's really hard to feel satisfied when we're eating in that way. Now, for some people, eating that way may suit, you might be the kind of person who eats little and often and that just works for you. And then great, if it's working for you, there's no right or wrong to this. But if it's feeling compulsive and it's feeling like unsatisfying, I suppose I would probably want to invite this person to try to prioritize or set an intention to find satisfaction with food. So rather than trying to put some rules in place to try and control their eating because they're so out of control, can they set an intention to find something more satisfying? And what that might mean, because you get into sort of a cycle with this, is it could mean, first of all, setting an intention to get in touch with your hunger. Because when you feel some hunger, then you can get more of a sense of what might be satisfying. And when you've got a little bit of hunger, you've got something to satisfy. You can satisfy this hunger. And satisfaction has a, a moderating effect when it comes to food. So yeah, I suppose to this person, I would want to say, check in with your feelings, get in touch with your hunger, and seek out satisfaction with food. Okay, next question. Have you heard of the book, Never Binge Again, and what do you think about the method? Okay, so Never Binge Again is a book by a man called Dr. Glenn Livingstone. And he struggled with compulsive eating himself, and he found a method that worked for him, and so he shares it with other people. Now, bits of it I quite like, and bits of it I think is quite problematic. Um, so one of this, his thinking is that, first of all, you need to separate yourself from your compulsive eating. And he suggests doing that by giving a name to the part of you that eats in an out of control or compulsive way. And the name he chooses for that is your pig. I'm not keen on the word, and I know it's something that a lot of people have said about his method. And his, he has said, you know, pick another name. If pig doesn't work for you, you could call it anything that might sound like less, I don't know, I think pig could be quite shaming. Not everybody's going to feel like that because that's the interesting thing about language is it has a different impact on all of us. So he's saying you can use another word, but throughout the book and in all of his videos and his podcast, he uses pig. And so he describes the kinds of foods, binge foods, as pig slop, which for me sort of moralizes the food a bit. It's kind of putting them into good and bad, which I doesn't quite sit right with, with how I think about this. 
and also any part of you that is trying to convince yourself to eat or to binge, I should say, like all those bingy thoughts and feelings, he calls that pig squeal. So the idea is you have to cage your pig with rules and any part of you that's trying to get yourself um, to break the rule or to eat in a, in a binge kind of way is pig squeal. So again, it's that idea of just trying to separate yourself from that. Now, the rule side of things is that one of the things I do quite like, and I've been thinking about rules ever since I got this question, and I, I did a post on it recently just to see what other people were thinking about, and it was actually on Glenn Livingstone's podcast that he had a guest on that said she had reframed rules. Instead of calling them rules, she called them decisions made ahead of time. And I really liked that because of something more freeing about it. So one of the positive things about his approach is you get to choose your own rules. So you get to decide exactly what they are. And what they're trying to do with this is that if you have a problem with alcohol, for example, it's much easier to draw a really clear line, for example, between drinking and not drinking. But when it comes to eating versus compulsive eating, that line isn't nearly as clear, especially when we're in the moment. Afterwards, we might look back and be able to see where the line was, but even then, it's often not that precise. So the idea of making a rule is that you set a really clear line, because the moment you've broken the rule, you've known you've crossed the line. Again, like the problematic side of that is that it, it kind of perpetuates the all or nothing thinking or you might think of it as it works with the all or nothing thinking depending on how strong the reaction is but his idea is that when you set a rule it's a never ever rule so this is again for some people this might work because some people it will be rules around types of food that's the bit that doesn't sit very well with the way I think about it. But other people set rules around like, never ever will I eat food in front of the TV. Or you can set rules with caveats, but they have to be very clear. So some people might say, never ever will I eat sugar, except on holidays, or something like that. So you get to pick your own rules. But, and I've seen on the forums people posting their rules, and sometimes people have got like 10 to 15 rules. And they're really... I look at some of those rules and to me they look a bit like disordered eating. So I think for certain people, but maybe it's working for them and that's where I have to try and be a bit humble instead of saying that, oh, I know better and that doesn't work and that doesn't work. But some people will, I've seen rules of never ever will I eat over X amount of calories and it's quite a low number of calories. So you need to be careful if you're going to set yourself any rules that it's not the eating disorder setting the rules for you. That these rules that you choose for yourself are ones that really make you feel free. So if this is something you're interested in, in checking out, he's got a podcast called Never Binge Again. Um, you can check out the podcast for free and see whether it resonates with you. And then the next question is, help, I was doing okay and in a healthy routine with food and exercise. Now my gym is closed, I am panicking again about food and I don't know what to eat. So when the first lockdown came around towards the beginning of this year, um, I had an influx of inquiries from people in a very similar position. And there were people who had historically struggled with food, got themselves into a, a fairly good routine with food, and they kind of, they'd managing their food guilt by exercise. So they'd got this balance where it kind of felt okay. It was quite rigid, but all in all, they felt like they were managing okay. And then lockdown came, the gyms closed, people were in their houses, and the exercise routines went out the window. And for these people, they suddenly felt really out of control with food. So the first thing I want to address in this question is around the panic. She says she's panicking. We can't figure out what to eat when we're panicking. We can't, we can't be still enough to hear what our body might want. So I think that panic is the first place to, to start. And the thing is with panic is it, it's one of those emotions or one of those feelings that can spiral out of control a bit because you start to feel panicky and then you panic about the fact that you're panicking and it kind of perpetuates itself. So it's almost like in a situation like this, recognizing the panic, naming the panic, breathing into the panic, accepting the panic. And I know it sounds counterintuitive, but actually when you accept the panic, 
it tends to calm down or reduce a bit. So looking after your physiology here is really important in terms of the panic response and knowing what to eat. So any kind of sort of breath work is, tends to be really good. I like the Wim Hof method. I think I've spoken about that before. If you just Google Wim Hof um, breathing technique or put it in YouTube, um, it can talk you through how to do that. And when I do that, for me, it's like hitting the reset button physiologically and I feel much calmer. So addressing the panic and then I don't know what exercise was like for this person, but I'm guessing that maybe exercise for them was about burning calories and burning food and all of that. So maybe it's an opportunity to develop a healthier relationship with exercise, by which I mean our bodies like to move. If we don't move our bodies all day, it tends to affect our mood, it tends to affect how we feel about ourselves and, and our food choices too. So something about even getting rid of the word exercise, which can have so many um, unhelpful associations for people. And just think about how can you move your body? How can you move your body in a way that feels good for your body? There are so many things. Again, YouTube, there's, you've got yoga, you've got dance videos, you've got I like the Les Mills body combat videos. Um, there are so many things that you can do um, in the comfort of your own home. And getting into a routine with movement um, is really helpful because then you don't have to keep negotiating with yourself. You know, if it's just you get up in the morning and you do 10 minutes on a yoga mat, only if this is, only if this is something that feels good for you, that you enjoy it and you, you get immediate benefits from, from feeling good. That's what we want from moving our bodies, ideally. Um, next question. I'm really upset with my mum because she won't stop commenting on what I'm eating. When I get upset and tell her to stop, she says she's only trying to help. She can be so judgmental. She knows I'm having a hard time with food, but she still does it. Okay, this to me sounds like a boundary is necessary here. Um, and before I talk about how I might think about it in this situation, I, I, I need to kind of preface this with I'm going to come from an assumption that her mum has good intentions even if she's quite misguided in how she's actually expressing her good intentions and it's not helpful. So this needs to be an uncomfortable conversation and the problem is, is most people try and put a boundary in in the moment that they feel like the boundary has been breached. So mum says something, maybe she raises an eyebrow and says are you sure you want to be eating that? Straight away you feel judged and you feel upset and you tell your mother you do not want her to say things like that anymore. Because you've said it in a moment when you're upset and you're triggered, now she's defensive. Because she, in her mind, she was just trying to help. She was just, maybe it was an act of love or whatever it was that she thought. She was just wanting the best for you. Her defences come up. So she can't hear it as a request. She experiences it as an attack. So she has to defend herself. So she becomes defensive, you're defensive, she's defensive, and neither of you are hearing each other. So when it comes to putting a boundary in, there needs to be a choice to have this conversation away from the situation itself. Don't wait till she says something to try and put the boundary in. This needs to be a conversation that you have when you're both calm. And it would look like something like, Mum, would it be okay if we had a chat about my eating? And so you're asking a question first, straight away, you're inviting someone to have a conversation. And I'm guessing that's not what you would normally say to your mum, so this is gonna make her listen. And maybe she can't do it there and then, so maybe you arrange to have it another time, but she knows that something, um, there's some seriousness behind this conversation. And then you may say to her, what I need from you, or what I'm asking for you, what I need is for you to not make any comments about my eating. Maybe you share with her, I'm struggling a bit, and what would really help me is if you don't make any comments. Are you willing to do this? Because a boundary goes both ways. It's all very well saying, I'm putting this boundary in, but really for a boundary to be effective, we want to invite the other person to agree to it. So we're asking for what we need. We're not saying what we don't want. So it's not going and saying, I don't want you to talk about, say anything about my food, are you willing to do this? You're saying what you want. So I want you to not say anything about my food. It's the same request, but it's slightly different. You're, you are saying what you don't want by saying what you do want. 
if that makes sense. And then you're offering an invitation because you can say this till you're blue in the face, but unless the other person agrees to it, they're going to keep making those comments. And we can't stop people from saying stuff. People are going to say what they're going to say. So we need to ask them and we need to tell them that it's important and we need to phrase it as a request and just say that this is something that's going to really help us. Because maybe your mum's just trying to help and if, if she could really understand that not saying anything is more helpful, she might be more willing to do it. If this boundaries thing is something that you're struggling with, if you're on Instagram, I highly recommend following um, at the people pleasing therapist. She puts a lot of great posts up about how to say no, how to have these kinds of conversations with people. Because so often we don't want to have these conversations. So we don't have them. And then the situation blows up. And then at that point we say something, but we just get blocked at every point because the other person can't hear us in those moments. We need to have those conversations at another time. And that takes some courage because, you know, it doesn't feel comfortable. But yeah. So those are the questions that I've got for today. I hope you found them useful. Um, take care of yourself and I will see you on the next video.